Welcome to episode number 341 of Destination Linux, your favorite video podcast. My name is Ryan. I'm Jill. And I'm Michael. And on this week's episode, we're going to be talking about Linux kernel maintenance and support policies that are changing. How is this going to affect you? Well, it's doomsday level, folks. It's doomsday level. And you got to listen to the whole episode so you know how doomsday this is. Then we're going to be talking about something that's not doomsday. In fact, it's coming to save the day, I think. I'm super pumped about this. The Raspberry Pi 5 has just been announced. This awesome. is big news. This is bigly. Yes. It's bigly. bigly. It's huge. But I know. It's going to be awesome. So we're going to talk about that. I'm very excited to get into that. And now we're going to get the show on the road towards Destination Linux. Our feedback this week comes from Rye, not Ryan, Rye. And they say, at what point are we going to say that KDE running on Fedora is the best setup for everyday users? I've used a gang of DEs, and I think we should focus on the most versatile and K-Wins. This also goes on to say, I love you guys, especially Jill. Oh. Why especially Jill, first of all? Why, also, is why do most emails end with, love you, especially Jill? <laughs> yeah. Like, why... Is that a Aww. thing our communities come up with behind the scenes? Or are they all playing like, <laughs> hey, if you write in the DL, make sure you say especially Jill. We got a message on Mastodon that was like very, uh, very positive towards the show and towards us. Nice. And then it said, especially Jill. And then we were like, okay, sure. <laughs> but <laughs> well, actually, I let them know that uh, Jill is also our favorite host as well. Yes, so. exactly. Aww. You know, how can you argue with them? <laughs> She's my favorite. So first of all, Rye, you knew exactly what you were doing with this email. I'm on to you. You're not going to fall for your little game. I know, and you should know as well, you never feed Michael KDE food after midnight. You just don't do it because what happens is he turns into a gremlin, little KDE gremlin, a Kremlin, Kremlin, <laughs> Okay, gremlin. <laughs> no, gremlin. <laughs> he gets on this soapbox and he won't get off of it. He won't get off of it. And he's going to talk about KDE for the rest of the show. And you knew what you were doing with that. That's why when he said K wins, there was a little emoji there with the laughing, smiling face there. So, That's true. yeah, yep. I'm on to you. But I do think Fedora is a fantastic distro. I do think mm -hmm. Fedora and KDE is a fantastic combination. I would, however, if you were being serious in your comment, not necessarily say it's for everybody because I think the best advice the community has kind of come up with when it comes to what distro should you use, even beginner distro, is like it depends on the user, right? What are they doing with their computer? And then you can match kind of the perfect setup for them. I think when you look at documentation and other things, you could make the case that Kubuntu, if you're a big KDE fan, would be a great choice because Absolutely. Kubuntu just has a lot of documentation and support that's already out there that you can search on. Fedora does too, but I think Kubuntu probably has more from a user standpoint. But it is a fire option, not taking away from there, and especially in certain use cases when it comes to what hardware and stuff that they're using. Fedora tends to be on a later kernel with newer Mesa drivers and things like that. So in those cases, absolutely Fedora is an awesome choice. So there you go. Aww. Jill, what do you think? Thank you so much, Rai. Um, I too think that KDE is one of the best DEs out there. And I love, absolutely love using it on my Steam Deck. Also, the Fedora KDE Plasma Spin is amazing and extremely stable. And speaking of use cases, I've uh, had m mostly when... When I was teaching, I taught for 30 years, uh, computer animation and motion graphics. And mostly, uh, I would uh, I, I had the students go on Ubuntu, and uh, specifically Ubuntu Studio. But in some cases, um, I would have them use Fedora and the KDE spin of Fedora because it is stable and it's RPM based. So it runs the likes of Maya and a lot of the other proprietary animation software much easier <laughs> so in some okay. cases some of my beginning students i've started them on uh on uh, fedora kde so yeah there's just I'm, a lot of good mm -hmm. distros and desktops and now we yeah. can just move on to the next topic well actually so, i was about oh, to just make geez. ryan's brain explode by <laughs> saying that 
y'all covered everything. You talked about how KDE Plasma is a great DE, mm-hmm. one of the best. Yeah. Talked about how Fedora is a stable and great distribution. It, it has some things that are great for everyday users. It also has some things that we, you would need to do some prerequisites that would make it, you know, better if you had those set up. So maybe mm-hmm. it's not for the beginner unless you have like a guide that it goes with it. So y'all said everything. So I'm just going to leave it at that and not go on to any rant really? on KDE and how it's amazing. I'm just going to just say well done and we're going to move on. And also I want to bring back this nineties trend because a lot of trends from the nineties are coming back for some reason. That's so and I'm going awesome. to, and I'm going to say psych, let's talk about KDE for an oh, hour. Gosh, we so, were almost there. Jill. We <laughs> almost, almost escaped. There. The KDE oh. gremlin emerges. <laughs> Yes, here we go. Uh, but seriously, though, KDE is fantastic. I got a bunch of videos on my channel. We'll link in the show notes for th- like tips you can do with KDE if you're not familiar with it. But I do think Fedora KDE is a fantastic mix. Well, like I said, there are some things that you, if you had a guide to fix a few things, it's not even a lot, but they're not like intuitive things to fix. You have to run some commands to add some uh, repos, add some uh, f- effects and like some codecs and stuff like that. Whereas with Kubuntu, you have the Ubuntu base that's a little bit easier to get started with. There are some things you still need to do, but there's fewer things. So I would say that beginner, everyday user may be Kubuntu more so than KDE Fedora. But I will say that Fedora KDE is fantastic, especially if you have a hardware that needs newer kernels and that sort of stuff. Then absolutely Fedora is the easier choice because they'll update faster. And you'll get you'll get the kernel updates in between rather than having to wait every six months and stuff like that. So there are different benefits for both of those. And the whole depending on what the user needs is a cop out answer and also the correct answer. Yeah. Well, reality is the best distro you can use right now is Blend OS, which combines all the distros into Unless one distro. Unless you're a beginner to Linux, yeah, and then, then it's too complicated. Even <laughs> then, you know what? Take so time to learn it. It depends on the distro. <laughs> be superior. In fact, I'm changing my answer to whoever the user is. It doesn't matter who the user is. Never heard of Linux? Blend OS. Best at Linux? Blend OS. Blend OS? Blend OS <laughs> is the and answer. And I'll follow that up with asterisks about the fact you'd have to learn how Arch works a little bit, and then you'll also have to learn the difference between cont- what a container is and what a mutable system is, yeah, and then you have to like, learn it. how what a flat pack is very quickly, and all all these different yeah. pieces. Well, so that maybe is maybe Ryan's not the best you know one to answer you know this question it now. It's time to go to school, <laughs> folks, and use Blend OS. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> all right, so uh, Gen 2 and Linux from scratch is all are also good options uh, based on Ryan's... <laughs> <laughs> Logic. Those are great options. Yeah. Uh, for beginners, maybe not. But in general, yes. Linux they from are, they, you will learn a lot from those. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I've still never done Linux from scratch. Oh, it's fun. Know? Yeah. I've done Gen 2, though, but not Linux from scratch. So there, there are certain types of people who are who hear Linux from scratch, and some of them would say, that was fun, like Jill did. And there's yeah. other people would say, that was like torturing myself <laughs> like I would. <laughs> For me, it was a year's journey, but I learned Linux really well doing that. And this is, wow. you know, in the early years of Linux. <laughs> Only Jill will learn a fun lot compiling from Linux from scratch. Year. That's true. Yeah. What's funny about that is that people say that Arch is hard. It is for beginners. Mm. And people say that Gentoo is hard and it's harder than Arch. And then LFS is its own beast. Its own beast, yes. Completely yeah. different situation because with Gentoo, you can get faster and faster because some people can get arch done in a couple hours gen 2 you could get in a day or so and then with if you get really really good at linux from scratch a week maybe if you're lucky Uh, we're gonna get the comment that that somebody did it in a day and it was so you know (laughs) but you know well we'll we'll have to ask them like okay give us details did you have a gui or did you just get to the terminal yeah Yeah. or script (laughs) or something post and you counted it (laughs) You know, some people collect Pokemon cards. Uh, others mm-hmm. collect baseball cards. Sure. I even, and I've never told people this before, have a little bit of a collection of UFC trading cards. Mm, nice. You know, I didn't even know those existed. Yeah, they're out there. And collections are vast as people's interests. You can collect things for nearly every hobby out there. However, Michael on this show has the strangest hobby of all. I have many hobbies and many collections. No, what are you talking about? This one's very weird. You collect domain names. You collect domain names like nobody I've ever seen in my life. 
That's like, just ridiculous. That's it's true. That's ridiculous. I only have about 70. What's 100, 70, 100, like my kids would say. They're <laughs> like, I want 70, 100 of this because that's what it's not just 70. Like Pokemon, Michael has to collect them all. Literally, and, and I mean this, any discussion we have with Michael about a new business thing always ends with, we should buy a domain for that. That's Michael's like input of let's buy a domain for that. He wants the dot com, the dot net, the dot biz, the dot community. He wants them all. He wants to collect them all because like they're going out of style. And okay, that's a bit excessive. I, I do have a lot of domains and those conversations have happened, but dot biz, really? <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that got you? That's the oh. one you're like, I don't collect those. I have three. <laughs> those are for plebs. I still have three. <laughs> Pleb collectors are the dot biz. So as yeah. you can imagine, this gets quite expensive uh, for us, but thankfully I was able to find a solution for that and that's where Namecheap comes in. Namecheap is a place where, as you guessed by their name, you can buy domains for cheap. They're for that Namecheap. That makes sense. Yeah. And you can also host sites, and they have other services there as well. So if you want to be like Michael and collect domain names, or you're actually starting a business and just need one, I suggest going to Namecheap. This is where we get ours. And we have a link in the show notes where you can start your collection and support our show all at the same time. You can do both at the same time. In fact, they could probably go to a really clever URL that you probably bought, Michael. So I got that, a domain for this, yeah. Ryan. Of course you do. <laughs> What's that domain, Michael? DestinationLinux.net slash Namecheap. See, the .net was a thing, but I wish it was .biz now because then I've been like, oh, you did buy a .biz. <laughs> well, so .net, I could add to my Linux. collection, Ryan. What about yeah. .tv? Yeah. Well, <laughs> don't, don't encourage him, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> so click that link and see if you can out-collect Michael. There's some really depressing news here, Michael. It's doomsday level of news. What's that? No. The, the Linux kernel support model's changing, Michael. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I see where you're going with what that. What happened? Well, so what happened is, is, well, actually this week at the Open Source Summit in Europe, the European version, there were some changes that were announced related to the model for the LTS, these long-term support, for those who don't know what LTS stands for where it will go from a six years of support down to just two years. Uh, Jonathan Corbett, a Linux kernel developer, made this announcement stating that not many people were using or taking advantage of these six years of support. And the biggest issue is that it's a pain to maintain for six years because the Linux kernel moves every six weeks and it is constantly changing with tons of different updates every single release. So keeping a six years maintenance is a giant task. So my first reaction to this is, yeah, and? <laughs> I mean, it's not like a huge That's deal not to most Michael. You're not really building this up into a doomsday Well, because I disagree problem. with your assessment oh, of doomsday. Okay. That's right. why. <laughs> You're allowed to be wrong. Okay, I mean, so why is it doomsday, Ryan? Well, let me tell you. First of all, Jonathan, don't assume that uh, many people weren't taking advantage of it because I also was not taking advantage of it. And you're probably <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I think for the standard user, honestly, this means nothing uh, for the standard user. I would be surprised if anybody's really impacted by this. If you can think of something, because I couldn't, then let us know in the comments. But really, the big key there is not many people were using it. So if it was so important, then there would be a ton of people probably uh, taking advantage of it does impact companies differently though because when you're looking at things like that what i view this as being made for and maybe i was mistaken because i wasn't there when they first announced this or it wasn't something that popped on my radar might have been there but it wasn't on my radar when they announced the six years is the iot devices and also potentially android phones so iot devices have you know anywhere from a two to four year kind of r d development cycle so while they're building this thing out uh, this is obviously having a six-year kernel is very advantageous for them from an update standpoint as you're sending out for testing, as you're adding additional um, functionality to the devices and those type of things. So I think a lot of people chose Linux to utilize for their IoT devices and other things because of the fact that it had this LTS at a very long support cycle. However, these are companies. So... One of the issues is maintaining it, and if they want to pay for it to be maintained longer or hire developers to maintain it longer, they probably should because it impacts companies the most there. And 
IoT devices are also known for the fact that it's very difficult, in some cases impossible, for you to go in and update the firmware and kernel and things in these. It's not because this is something that is a problem for IoT companies or IoT devices because it inherently is just a thing that they have so much R&D that they have to do. It's because the, once they release it, they're done and don't bother to, like, there are yeah. some IoT devices that will do updates. And then there are some that just pretend that it's, oh, it's a simple product. We're done. We don't need to touch it anymore. But that's not how it works when you're using computers, especially when your computer is designed to be on the internet at all times it kind of is important to do updates. And that's why I think that not only is this a good thing, it's kind of like a good kick in the face to the IoT companies that don't update because maybe now they'll either not release the product or they'll maybe update. It also isn't that big of an issue in the first place because the difference between the LTS kernels, there's a thing that the Linux kernel has where they insist on never breaking user space. So with the IoT devices, they're not doing an insane amount of stuff. It should be possible to go from LTS two years to two years and it still work with whatever they're doing because they're not doing a super complicated typically with an IoT device. So I don't think it's that big a deal even for them too. I think it's not a big deal to put this on their shoulders because it's not a Linux maintainer oh, yeah, also, in Linux yeah, for sure. kernel developer fault. However, I think you put way too much faith in companies that they won't just release this now with an LTS kernel that's four I'm, years out I'm, of date <laughs> and no security patches. I'm not putting the faith. It's just a hope. That's there. a hope. Yeah. I know just, they will do it, but I just yeah. the hope they don't. But we'll just also, leave it non-secured. It doesn't affect hardly anything, really. It doesn't affect users. It really doesn't even affect distros because distros, most of them that are having an LTS option, have a longer lifespan anyway than the six years. So, for example, like Ubuntu has the 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 long-term support versions, but it also has like an enterprise support management system where you have five years for LTS, but then the ESM is 10 years. So they're already doing more than what the kernel was offering in the first place. And the same thing with Red Hat and SUSE, because they offer a, like a five-year thing or a 10-year thing, depending on which, which version and branch you're talking about. So these are much longer than the, the kernel itself anyway, so it doesn't affect them either. So it only people it really affects are the people who are not wanting to do updates. And in those cases, I would say... You're update. one of those people who don't update. <laughs> oh, good, That's good. not true because an LTS is every two years and I update once every two years. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, all, all good points, Michael and Ryan. In fact, like Michael said, you know, my first reaction to this was that it is really no big deal, especially for for the average Linux user. And but but Ryan is what right. It's it's all about the businesses and um, it's all about the Benjamin <laughs> businesses, Michael, not and, Benjamin. Oh, you know, right. like Pentiums, all about the Pentiums <laughs> for uh, businesses that do IoT, industrial, and especially aerospace, which needs more time for R and D to upgrade their systems that need to be hardened for the work environments. And also another point is particularly with aerospace, they're using older hardware. So they need to keep the kernels older. <laughs> so. Well, the thing is, I don't think that the aerospace <laughs> stuff is the industrial stuff might be related, but I also think there those companies could afford to help maintain and that's if they so need it. True. Yeah. But the aerospace is different because yeah. when they talk about introducing new hardware or new kernels or whatever, it's usually 10 to 15 years anyway. So the LTS support of six years really didn't even apply yeah, in the first yeah, place. Yeah, they're using older kernels <laughs> like anyway. it's super old. Yeah. The stuff that's in the International Space Station is from the 90s in some cases. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and in fact, before they uh, the shuttles, uh, they stopped the shuttle program, uh, they were just upgraded to 486s. <laughs> Woo, <laughs> yeah. man. That's some speed demons right there. I mean, the, but you would agree, Jill, like instead of buying the golden hammer, you go and you spend some of that money some on some maintainers there, right, yeah. to help maintain this. I mean, the, one of the issues that Corbet goes on to mention that developers are burning out. So the people yeah. who have to test this code on all of this various hardware for six years, and there's so many things for them to test. And lots of different versions to test as well. Yes, lots of different versions to test as well in there. And this is a big deal, right? Yeah. Because 
we need them to be testing, especially in my case, this is me being selfish here. Like I want them testing for the latest and greatest hardware and all that type of stuff oh, yeah. so that Linux continues to propel forward, not taking, you know, we already have 2000 programmers for the kernel. We have 200 new developers on the latest release in there. So we've got a lot of momentum when it comes to the kernel and all the cool things that they're releasing. But I want that stuff to be solid when it's releasing, right? So I want the maintainers and stuff, and preferably to be working on that. But Jill, out of everyone here, really me and Michael should shut up because you actually have all of these antique computers and older systems yeah. and all of this stuff. <laughs> and the question is, does this impact you? No, because again, they are on older distros and older kernels. I can upgrade some of them to newer kernels, but most of them I can't. I haven't been able to because they discontinued support for i386 and so on. <laughs> so. Yeah. But you don't have a problem with that because you're using them for the the, the joy of having the retro exactly. computer. So as long as you're able to use it in any way, it's that's what that's all it matters. Yeah, right? that's all that matters. I'm not not using them to render animation anymore like I used to years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, because those kernels are still around. It's not like they just disappear from the universe. Yeah. The universe gets yeah. rewritten. And also some distros still support versions yeah. for those kinds of things. You yeah, know? like yeah. Debian. That's one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite favorite distros because it, it will actually support uh, hardware that the kernel doesn't. One more thought here. There was a big rumor going around, still out there, that Google is going to switch away from utilizing Linux in there as, a, as kind of a base for their kernel. And they were going to use, I don't remember what it was Fuchsia. called. Fuchsia. Fuchsia. That's yeah. it. They were going to use Fuchsia. And they ended up putting Fuchsia in one of their home assistant devices, Google Home or something like that, whatever it's called, that I would never put in my home anyways. But they put it in one of those things and everyone was like, that's it. That's the end of uh, Linux and Android and all of that. And we'll no longer be able to say, hey, Linux runs most of the smartphones out there. Of course, that hasn't happened. But it does make you wonder, you know, there is a long R&D factor here with Android and new Android devices. And these Android devices are based on LTS. Does this impact Google's decision to keep utilizing Android or are they going to, you know, accelerate using Fusia uh, because of this lack of six years of support it might be something they relied on. So does this hurt us in the smartphone market was something that popped in my mind as a potential issue. Yeah, that's I don't think so question. because the Fuchsia thing was announced while there was a six year support, but also Android has been around for so long, much longer than the six year amount was because the six years hasn't been around for that long. There are kernels that are being maintained for six years now, but that's about to end for some of them. I don't think before that there was anything more than two, two to three years or four years at the most. So it's gone up and down in terms of how long the, the, the support was offered. But in the very early stages when Android was first made, that wasn't even really an option. So for a long time, I don't think it matters, but also... They can use the LTS kernel for their own system, but they also tweak their the kernel they customize anyway. It. Yeah, they yeah. customize so it. Yeah, I don't think it makes that much difference to them. Regardless, I think they use the LTS kernel just so they don't have to do the customization more than once every two years or something like that. Yeah, and it seems like the the whole hype around Fuchsia has kind of died down a bit. I I I just haven't yeah. seen a lot of activity on it. Although there's obviously a huge need for an alternative operating system yeah. because based on Apple 15 and as boring as it is, and as boring as all the Android devices are out there, like this is the time for someone to strike. I've been saying that for like three years, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody, but EOS, if you want to check out the latest video I have, if you want to check out EOS, an alternative Android operating system on the Fairphone 4 you kind of might get a glimpse of the future, I feel like. I feel like I got a glimpse of the future there. It was pretty Hopefully cool. Hopefully that is the future. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. We'll have a link in the show notes for the unboxing and first impressions that Ryan had. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Now, here's my only, my last point. I said the last point was my last point, but this is really, really, <laughs> really, truly my last point, okay? Also, earlier you said that we, me and you should both shut up, and <laughs> you're now talking more. Well, listen, this is, this is my last point. <laughs> so here's my last point. My last point is this. Why have this rollout? Ma maintainers for a kernel 
have always been a luxury item, right? Like you want as many maintainers checking the code, doing bug reports, all that stuff. It's, it's a huge, amazing sure, option yeah. that we have of volunteers. So why roll out six years in the first place to roll it back? Because it's so easy to add new features to something. So my, I guess my only thing, okay, it's not a doomsday issue. I can't see how it's really a big issue at all. But why change to six years and then go, eh, you know, actually maintainers are being burnt out and we don't like it anyway, so let's roll it back. And just, why do it? It's kind of a GNOME move. I think it's because there was maintainers at the time that were willing to do it and now they don't want to do it. But I also think that's fine because if they change their mind, then, because maintaining a kernel that moves constantly, even for two years, is still a massive amount of work. Mm -hmm. So tripling that is even more crazy yeah, in terms of amount, the amount of work to begin with that's what i'm saying don't give I think it and take it away they, when they Just first announced it. it it was because companies were willing to do some kind of support with resources and things like that i don't remember which companies but there was a like a coalition that were willing to do it because they wanted that to happen mm, so the team was agreed to do it and it seems like some maybe the resources are gone maybe the interest of it or they just showed that people weren't really using it because if you go back to if you look at the list of what main like what kernels are being maintained for the six year thing i'm not sure exactly which exact version but it was 4.16 or something like yeah. that that's still usable yeah. and no one uses that like uh, even enterprise people enterprise companies don't use that kernel because even if they have a 10 year support they're still bumping no the kernel no one we okay know of. No one in the sense of, I'm confident saying 99.6% do not use it. <laughs> okay, that helps, 99.6%. Jill, what is your thought on that? Yeah, so um, I, I know that change was made quite a while ago. And, and that was actually in a time where the cadence of new hardware was slower. So mm, th that could be one of the re reasons why. Uh, yeah. So basically, when I joined Linux and started whining <laughs> about the support of hardware in the <laughs> Linux kernel, I ruined this. So this is single handedly <laughs> my fault, basically. Yeah. No, I don't think so because no, I isn't. think the kernel was still trying to do it. This was just more of like keeping the old hardware usable. I think what this is kind this is more of like them doing it because of all the constant talk about you ha saying that Linux works on new hardware. We need to put it on new hardware. Why do the distros not work on new hardware? All of that is why they're doing it because they're focusing on the new hardware rather than the older hardware. So You're welcome, people. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I ended the six years of support. It's now two. You helped Deal with us it. progress, Ryan. <laughs> yes, that's it. I moved you all forward whether you want to or not. This episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010, and LinStore, industry-leading open source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open source community, and they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features. Linbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms and OSs without vendor lock-in. What that means is, is that you could choose the software on any platform, including specific hardware that you want to use or just off-the-shelf hardware that you get and connect it. You get, all of this stuff can be interchanged really easily. And with DRBD and LinStore, you can have high-speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration. Whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula, there's even DRBD proxy for long-distance replication. Linbit is run by its founders to this day, and all of its engineers and developers are in-house with offices in Europe and North America, which allows them to have global 24-7 support to complement their enterprise offerings. Visit linbit.com to learn more about the people behind Linbit and the awesome software for block storage, duplication, and more. All right, I'm really going to move you forward here with this next thing that I'm going to talk about because this had me so excited. I called Michael immediately when I heard the announcement and he goes, I know, dummy, look at the show notes. That was literally his response. I'm not even <laughs> that is, exaggerating that's there. not the exact words I said, but close. Yeah. I, and I, I mentioned, you, yeah, I sent you the message like seven hours ago. <laughs> yeah. So I'm very excited about this Raspberry Pi. We've talked about it on the show, how important I think they are to the growth of Linux, the acceptance of Linux, the you know, the whole idea of people thinking like, well, if you're not paying for something, then it can't be that good, right? And a business can't rely on it and 
all of these type of things that you hear out there that are, of course, factually wrong. But Raspberry Pi was one of those that kind of brought Linux to everybody, every hobbyist oh, yeah. out there, businesses out there. I know telecom companies that utilize these in their centers and things to run certain operations. Like Raspberry Pi has become a part of our culture. It's as much of a, a part of American culture as, as apple pie. Yeah. <laughs> See what I did there? It is. <laughs> uh, apple pie reference. That was pretty good. Uh, I'll pat myself the reference, on the back yes. later. Uh, so... <laughs> Coming at the end of October is a Raspberry Pi 5. And Michael, I remember in our Raspberry Pi episode where we were talking about how important Raspberry Pi is to Linux yeah. and open yeah. source, that you mentioned, hey, I think soon they'll be coming out with a Raspberry Pi 5. And boom. I, pre I predicted it. You in did. In fact, I predicted yes. it in our 20, 2023 predictions episode. Uh, but so, Michael, I mean, people can go, huh? What's Michael, that Michael, we didn't do a predictions episode for this year. But okay, they job. didn't know that. Why did you have to spoil it? <laughs> okay, so maybe I didn't predict it. I did mention that it would be great. The the Pi Five would be coming out, and I would hope it was coming out soon. Yeah, I didn't technically predict it. So <laughs> fine, Jill, if you want to be that way. Why didn't we do a prediction episode? I don't. I know, know we didn't. We missed I, I, it. <laughs> I don't know why, but year. yeah, we did. We missed it. Good this job, month. Michael. <laughs> well, you're the one who chooses what we talk about usually. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. Talk about the Raspberry Pi. It's not about you, Michael. It's about the Raspberry oh, Pi. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Yeah. You. Okay, I understand. So let's talk about the Raspberry Pi because it is coming out very soon with the five version, and just sixty dollars will get you the four gigabyte version. Eighty dollars will get you the eight gigabyte version, and, and they talked about the improvements to the platform. And they say that virtually every aspect of it has sure. been upgraded. In fact, they're saying that it is twice as fast as the Raspberry Pi 4, which was already very impressive for the single board computer that it is. Now it's twice as fast as that. I can't wait to play with it. It's still the size of a credit card. I mean, that's the amazing thing. Yeah. There are now faster boards out there that are made by other companies. You got Orange Pi. I think it's Rock Chip makes some more fast boards, better processors, those type right. of things. But it's the fact that the Raspberry Pi's form factor has been integrated into everything from all the hobbies, Legos, all of these different things, right? You've got all these different hats and devices and everything Raspberry Pi fits in. And it's so small and nimble. And a lot of those other boards are much bigger. Uh, there's some coming out now, but uh, that are a little smaller, but they were able to keep that form factor and then double the power which i think is very yeah, impressive i think it's the exact same form factor as last time isn't it no it's a form different. factor as far as the size of it yes but obviously some pins and things have moved around and well, i mean will the case still changed. be compatible or no, do you need to change no, your case? no you do have to upgrade get okay. a new case yep. yeah you will need to get a new case in there and so you've got a 2.4 gigahertz quad core 64-bit arm cortex a76 cpu what does yeah. that mean? It's faster. <laughs> okay, know. just know it's faster. Oh, okay. And then you also get a new GPU in this, which is quite an impressive GPU. It's the Video Core 7 GPU, which supports OpenGL ES3.1. Ryan, 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 it's not the 7, it's the VII. <laughs> oh, oh, thanks, Michael. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. I was going to sound silly there, but you're right. It does say VII, you know? <laughs> exactly. Which, what does the V stand Roman for, numerals. Michael? Come on, Michael, Victory. you can do it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, uh, what does the new GPU allow you to do? Well, it works with H.265 4K at 60 frames per second, or you can drive two 4K monitors. And in some of the video that I've seen of the demonstrations, it can drive them without stuttering and stuff. Because Raspberry Pi 4 technically could drive some 4K video and things, but it was pretty sloppy in, in, in certain instances. It would kind of be choppy. Sloppy is not the right word. Choppy in certain instances. It, it, and claiming 4K 60, yeah, in fact. Yeah. Exactly. It's 60. So they've kind of doubled there. And so that new GPU, I think, is pretty cool. But there's so much more. There's so much uh, more to talk about than just that. Uh, Jill, before I go on, because <laughs> I'll never shut up, what are you excited about? about this? That's true, people. This he is doesn't something shut up I, ever. so simple. We finally get a power button on the Raspberry Pi. Oh my Pi. gosh. That is yes. so important. <laughs> that is so it nice. really is. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's on the very bottom of the list of what they're talking about, but it is such a thing that people have been begging for for years. Yeah. Not to mention for importance in in the industry whether, you know, it's robotics or IoT is um if you, you know, do a quick shutdown, it can corrupt the hard drive on the Pi. So the SD mm-hmm. card and this will help prevent that. <laughs> Yeah. No, this is a really important feature too, because yeah. sometimes I'm setting things up and I'm really not ready for it to power on. But yeah, you, know, you accidentally this, plug it in and realize, yes, you oh, plug whoa. it in and it starts booting and it's like, I don't even have the operating system in there, you know, whatever. It's just one of those things that's annoying. So it's, it's simple and small, but it's, to me, it's a huge improvement. Yeah. I agree, so. And also two USB 3.0 holes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Holes, and those are of course, supporting. I like how I'm holes. <laughs> just holes. Those yeah. are supporting five gigabits <laughs> per second, which is pretty impressive yeah. too. So not slow. And you still get your 40 pin GPIO header because I know there's people out there like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the header? Is it still there? Has that changed? That's still there. It's very important for a lot of people. Thank but, you. Oh, thank you for explaining. I was I was worried about that because that's I deal with the, yes. those things. Yes. Never. But uh, <laughs> so it's this line of pins, Michael, allow you to do all the accessories and, and basically. Well, I know what they do. Yeah. Just okay. Never use right. them. Just check. Because that's how you sure. that's how you hook up the hats. That, yeah. That, good job, Michael. And, I'm impressed. Oh, oh, Michael and Ryan, we've got PCIe 2.0 interface. Speaking of hats. For fast peripherals. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So this is magnificent. Yes. There's all kinds of cool things you can do by throwing a PCIe slot on there, right? Mm-hmm. Number one, think about an external graphics card. Now, there's people already out there trying it, which means it will happen because this is Raspberry Pi, and there's so many geeks out there who are going to make this work, and there's some driver issues and things with ARM if and stuff. If it is technically possible, it will but happen. <laughs> it is possible. It is possible with this PCIe. But you can also do things like utilize multiple NVMe drives for servers, you know, especially with the 10 gigabyte network, uh, yeah. you know, capabilities that has all the AI things you can do when you have some external potential for graphics cards and things that you're connecting to, um, all the hats. So when you talk about hats being on the GPIO, you could actually do some hats now direct into the PCIe. So this unlocks some new capabilities for hats as well that you can use. And so maybe an external GPU on a Raspberry Pi, you'll be really cooking some amazing gaming or AI or other machine learning functionalities and things you could do with this, which would be pretty cool. And they have a new Southbridge chip too, their own chip called the RP1 chip. And this is going to control the input output functioning specifically. So you're going to have two USB 3 controllers with five gigabytes of bandwidth and two USB 2 controllers in there as well. So a lot faster in your peripheral side and your input-output functionality being controlled by its own chip. Mm -hmm. So these are major enhancements to this little device, making it absolutely something I have to have. In fact, I've pre-ordered two. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) And we got Bluetooth 5.0 as well with uh, Bluetooth low energy support. And you kind of want to use the Bluetooth because it doesn't have your speaker 3.5 millimeter, it didn't look like. So sound is now going to be pretty much just Bluetooth. HDMI. HDMI, correct. Yeah, yeah, I guess you could do it through the HDMI. So those are really your only two choices there. So they did take it away from us there <laughs> a little bit, but that's okay because they gave us so much yes. more here on this little credit card. You got to you got to figure out they got to remove something. To yeah, this cool they stuff do. Yeah, on there. So I don't know. I'm very excited about this. I mean, very a, excited. Bajillion things you can do with the Raspberry Pi. You can have it be your home assistant. It can control your entire home assistant setup. Uh, you could utilize it for robotics. Uh, you know, Wendy utilizes it a lot for competitions and STEM learning and all of that, those things with kids and, and learning. So if you're not, if you have not picked up a Raspberry Pi yet, go grab a five now because it's going to sell out. I promise you, it's going to sell out. It's probably going to sell out much faster than you think. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. like this has been Raspberry Pi's biggest <laughs> issue. Like if it hasn't already sold out, really. Mm -hmm. It might be by the time we're recording this. Because that's their biggest problem is supply chain. And honestly, Raspberry Pi is in a bad spot with that. However, I understand they've got some good partnerships with Sony here. Mm -hmm. They kind of got things back in order. But I say bad position because it's a lot of competition to kind of catch up. 
uh, really fast with them. And competition is always a good thing too. So, you know, I think that's good to have that out there, but I want Raspberry Pi to be successful. They're kind of one of the first to really make this popular and they deserve a lot of success with this. So I'm very excited to get my hands. Yeah, it's Pi been Pi. the Raspberry Pi 4 came out in uh, the summer of 2019, just before yeah. the pandemic. And mm. that's been our last major release with the exception of the Raspberry Pi 400, which I have. Yeah, and also getting you. a Raspberry Pi 4 was a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. So much so, I never got a chance to get one. Oh, Aww. okay. So... I am Do very much face, looking Mike. forward to five. <laughs> Except, especially that elusive eight eight gigabytes of RAM one. So, oh, right. yeah. yeah. That's the one I wanted. And that was very difficult yeah. to get. Unless you wanted to pay an exorbitant amount of like the squatter money. Like, no, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, those people, those terrible human beings out there that like to go buy stuff that they don't plan on using. So the rest of us who actually want to use it can't because you're a monster and a moron and I dislike you immensely. Okay, Michael and Ryan. So now we have a new and more powerful Raspberry Pi 5 coming just mm -hmm. in time for creating a new private Raspberry Pi server to run Valve's latest upgrade, Counter-Strike 2. Yes. So the Pi can run... The server for the game. Okay. Yes. You're going to have to, what? <laughs> yeah. So, so many years ago, I actually helped with the Counter-Strike server on a Raspberry Pi. And we got up to 15 people being able to use Counter-Strike wow. running from a Raspberry Pi. Oh, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> so I knew it could run the server. <laughs> I know it can play CSGO on some super low settings, or at least people have hacked certain games like Half-Life, I think. But it's very, very choppy. But the server, 15 players, and it was running pretty well. Yeah, with 15 it was running very Man. well, in fact. It's amazing what you can do with Raspberry Pi. Yeah. yeah. In fact, originally we had tried with, with just uh, five players, and it was running so well, we kept increasing the number of players that can play on it. And we got That's up awesome. to 15 simultaneous players using it. So <laughs> Counter-Strike 2. Now, Counter-Strike 1, I remember probably one of the times I've laughed the hardest in a gaming was playing Counter-Strike 1 with Michael in that new mode they had where you were, what was it called? Battlegrounds? I mean, okay, first of all, that was not Counter-Strike 1. Counter-Strike 1 was a long CSGO. time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like 20 years ago. Uh, CSGO is what we're talking about. There was some, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like a mission system and you uh, had like a you basic. Oh, are you talking about the mission system? Or are you talking about the, yeah, where the, we kept grenading each other and stuff? Yeah, on yeah. Accident so, and all I can't that. remember what it's yeah. called, but it was some kind of like the cooperation operation mission thing. We are not. And go up. we played this game, and we should have streamed the whole. We should have streamed it, but we didn't. But we played this game, and it was so much fun because of how bad we are at this game. It was hilarious. <laughs> My and sides hurt. I remember so, watching you guys play it. <laughs> Oh. We tried We tried to do this mission system. We played many times on stream the game. Yeah. And it's, it's also fun just to watch us play the, the, the game that we couldn't do anyway. But this mission system, we tried so many times. I don't remember if it was like 20, 30. It was uh, somewhere around there. there. And we just could not get it done. And it was hilarious <laughs> because we, we, we don't even know why we couldn't get it done or whatever. But we would try different configurations. It just never worked. So then I had a, a, a sneaky idea. I'll get my friend who's good at Counter-Strike or first-person shooters, and we'll go through that mission, and then he'll tell me what to do, and then I will play again with Ryan and blow his mind of like, right. oh, look how, how I fixed it, and it's so yeah. good. <laughs> and that's what happened. And then we got done, and we finished the mission, and he said, I think you, Ryan, if I correct you, if I remember correctly, you said, so how did you cheat, Michael? <laughs> yeah, Aww. exactly. Of course. <laughs> Cause like all, he knew how to like duck in certain areas and stuff. I'm like, you don't, you don't know this. Cause literally when we played before he was accidentally like dropping grenades in the boat we were supposed to use to get across the, oh, okay. the water. So now okay, all of a sudden I he dropped a grenade one time accidentally. And then for the next to three, four rounds, Ryan and I would just throw grenades at each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Do you know when yeah. I played it, I am not good at first person shooters only because I don't right. have good vision. So it's a, We're it's, not good at first-person shooters because we don't have coordination, <laughs> yeah, or or skill yeah. reflexes. So, 
so my tactic, and I've actually won a few games doing this, was kind of hiding. And then when someone comes close to me, you know, shooting them through a window. I mean, that it, it does work. Oh, it was my you're technique. you're a little sneaky. I, w- I had yeah, to be that's, sneaky. That's stealth mode. Yeah. I think that's totally... Guerrilla war. Yeah. That's definitely right a, a valid style of playing those games. <laughs> and I actually won a, a few of the games because of that. So I Feels had, like Rambo in CSGO. She <laughs> drops be- slowly down from the tree <laughs> and then goes back up into hiding. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was playing with young people that had good vision. So I'm like, okay, well, I got to find a new tactic. <laughs> And it worked. I actually won a few games. Nice. (laughs) Listen, I love that. At my age, I can't beat my son anymore at any of these games. So you have to outsmart him. That's your only option. You're not faster. (laughs) You're not going to be more coordinated. So you just. So I haven't seen this. So um, they, they, for those who don't know, Ryan and his kid play in different rooms in the house. And I suspect it's because his kid knows Uh, that Ryan will reach over and unplug the control. Yeah. (laughs) There you go. This is true. Yes. I will do whatever it takes to win. Cheating (laughs) is definitely a part of that. So I'm very excited about this. CSGO, Steam has been a huge supporter of Linux, obviously, with the Steam Deck and all of these things. This has been a masterfully popular game. Some of the best gaming tournaments out there. You can watch Mm -hmm. your CSGO tournaments. So what are some of the best? uh, There's a lot of changes, but what are some of the top changes in your mind, Jill, for CSGO uh, 2? uh, Definitely uh, physically-based rendering. Uh, ray tracing, anti-aliasing, uh, better smoke. And yeah. it's just o- overall, oh, the textures were all upgraded. You know, the, the game just looks absolutely beautiful. And I was playing it this this afternoon. And I noticed also that the mouse, when, when playing the game, is more responsive. And Valve actually put a lot of work in the mouse movement being as low latency and accurate as possible in this game. They, they stepped it up way up and I noticed how quickly everything moved. (laughs) That's awesome. Now I noticed that a lot of new games, like there's another modern warfare coming out, not the one that just came out, but another one that's literally coming out in a couple months, like figure that one out. I can't. And it's about $89, I think. And then there's of course the new MK one mortal Kombat, And it was like $105 for their, Big, big. That was version. their special edition. If the yeah. regular edition was like sixty, like the no sixty nine ninety nine. They raised these prices for just the regular edition, and then mm-hmm. Baldur's Gate was sixty nine ninety nine. The new Baldur's Gate as well. So I'm assuming this has got to be what probably in the seventy dollars. I mean, it's worth it. Probably seventy eighty dollar range. Too, I think right? it's going to be even more than that. Maybe like a yeah. hundred and fifty because it's very popular. Uh, no, no. It is. At- oh, you're saying it's two hundred because that's what this Counter Strike Two yeah. means. Yeah. <laughs> It is the cost of free. Ah, free. <laughs> Imagine and it that. might be free as in beer, but <laughs> it is the cost of of still free. free. What's interesting to me is that I went when I heard CSGO 2 was coming out and I went onto the page to go buy it. And the fact that it's free is really interesting because I would have paid money for it. Now, I probably wouldn't have paid $69 for it. Let me be clear. But I thought an upgrade, 29 bucks, 20 bucks, I'd have paid that for it. I think so. Originally, CSGO, when we were playing it because, with our, our massive, amazing skills Skill, yeah. on the missions and on the uh, battle dome thing, it, uh, whatever, the stuff that's kind of like Fortnite, but not Fortnite, whatever that's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm so, clearly, we're so good at that game. So this... When when we first started playing that game, it was I think twenty bucks. I think it originally wasn't a free to play. At some point, you had to pay for something with CS:GO, but no, I think fact- it was a, a pay for game, and then they decided to make it free free to play after. That's so I'm cool. pretty sure I remember paying for it, and then some upgrade happening, and they said we're going to free to play, and don't worry, everybody who's already paid for CS:GO gets an extra thing, and I'm like, cool, mm-hmm. I get an extra thing to a game that I'm so good at. Yeah, that's good. It's very good that that so it's, happened. So it's it's actually better because it's not just because they made a free to play game. They made a game that was so good, people paid for it for decades, and then decided, you know what, let's make yeah. it free. Yeah. And here's the other thing, Jill, is that uh, we may be doing a gaming session if this really cool interview we're working on happens, which Yay. we're not going to tell you who we're interviewing, but it's very exciting. And if that happens, Jill, me, and Mike, we're going to get together and we're going to do some gaming and. I think it has to be. CSGO oh too. boy. It has to be. Yeah. That way 
Jill can see how bad we are and be like, come on the show the next week and be like, I she totally watched the stream, the Ryan, and she's pretty yeah, sure I, I, that she, she knows. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, so you can show us our her tactics so we can actually get good. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, there actually are a few bugs, notably issues of sound or the game crashing on Linux. But Valve is paying attention to the bug reports and should fix them very soon as an update. And in fact, uh, today when I was playing it earlier, for me, there was no sound launching the game for the first time. But all I had to do is a simple pipe wire fix in the launch options in the game properties and put TAC SDL audio driver space pipe wire. And it worked fine. Awesome. And now it sounds perfect. So they're easy fixes. There's also a fix for for Pulse Audio as well. And, Very cool. Uh, cool. Yeah. Well, for those who are looking to get Counter-Strike, we'll have a link in the show notes. But if you've never heard of it before, it's on this thing called Steam. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to look now, that up on Google later. You might have to because it's, it's very hard to find. <laughs> but you know what else that you should check out? Well, our software spotlight is Photop, and I wanted to talk about Photop because they are celebrating 10 years of this application, 10 year wow. anniversary of this application, and I use it basically every day, maybe not every day, but almost every day. And for those who don't know, Photop is kind of like a Photoshop alternative, but what's really cool about it is that it's a web app. You don't have to install anything. You can just go to photop.com and boom, you have a photo ma manipulation software. And this is not just one. There's a bunch of these kinds of things on the web. This not, it's not one of those where it's just, oh, we can do a few small things like remove red eye or rotate and crop things. This thing is effectively 80% as good as Photoshop. And that blew my mind the first time I used it. I started playing with this and it changed the way I did my graphics work because as a Linux user, I also was a professional graphics designer who had to use Photoshop, which meant I had to use a virtual machine of Windows to run Photoshop. I and don't that like how you're pretending this is any better. It's not open source software. You should be using GIMP. You're a traitor. <laughs> Have okay. a nice day. First of all, Aww. thank you, uh, YouTube commenter. Oh, so. <laughs> I'll address those in a second because okay. those are those right. are interesting points that should be addressed. But the thing is, when I was using Photoshop in a VM, I it, it bothered me because I was 99% a Linux user and technically 1% of Windows user because I had to use Photoshop. And then I found Photop and it effectively changed everything because I could use almost everything I needed to use in Photop. And then they started adding more and more features. And sure. the, one of the biggest features that I missed in Photoshop was the ability to use the CMYK color space for printing. And then Photop added it. So, okay, great. I have, I have CMYK. That's awesome. And it also works really good with Photoshop documents like PSDs. So you can convert things into Photop or really easily open stuff from Photoshop if you're working with other people. And so many things that it's, it's, it seems like a dream that it's happened. And it's also a web app. And it was made by, I, I think for the majority of it, maybe all of it, by one person, which is just crazy to me. And you can get access to it for only $50 per year. Now you can also use it for free, but there's ads on the free version. So if you don't want ads, you can pay for the $50 per year, which is also a steal because that's it's such a good program. What's and that? I just, one one hundredth of the cost of Adobe Photoshop there at fifty dollars <laughs> yeah, a year. Yeah, I think yeah. if you if you just get Photoshop by itself, it's like twenty dollars per month. But I but also that's not exact. I don't. It's it's possible, but not the best. So if you wanted to get one, you would get like fifty dollars per month for the like the suite or whatever. No, it's and so it's, inexpensive. And it also well requires you. It it also requires you to be constantly connected to the internet to use it. Whereas the Photopea doesn't technically, you can just load the web page and then disconnect if you want to, which is really cool because it means you're not having to worry about uploading your files because a lot of times these tools would require you to upload your files to their uh, server yeah. before you can use it. Whereas Photopea, you just load it in the browser and then work on it and that's it. So you don't have to be connected the entire time just when you first load it. But let's address the elephant in the role. Just the, use GIMP. The, be done. The comment that Ryan mentioned. I'm an expert artist, and so, <laughs> I use GIMP. So, so he all you also don't use GIMP, right? No, 
<laughs> he's photo p but yeah, exactly. for the purposes of this skit for for this bit right here we're yeah. gonna, so uh, in this is gonna be a i knew this was happen is people were going to come every time i talk about photo p i always mention that it's better than gimp because it is and we usually get a comment from here or there about Goes, this -uh. yeah and the difference is because a lot of people look at GIMP as being because it's a free so a free open source product that it's automatically good beca better because of that, and that's not how software works. So, <laughs> first of all, yes, it's cool that that exists, and for most people, I'd say probably 85, 90 percent of people, GIMP works fine. It will do what you need it to do, but it will do it very slowly, and in some cases, not at all. So a professional use case is a much different use case than an Don't average talk user. talk down to me. I know professional. <laughs> I go and I click the paintbrush and the pencil tool, <laughs> and then I draw squiggly lines to make a Michael, and then I save it in whatever <laughs> yeah. format I want. Your and I'm art done. is just unmatched. Thank you. Unparalleled. Yeah. Thank you. To a monkey. So <laughs> this. <laughs> so the. The, the reason why GIMP is not as good as PhotoP is because of one particular thing. There's there's a lot of different features that PhotoP has that GIMP doesn't have, but there's one in very important difference, and that is destructiveness and non-destructiveness. PhotoP is non-destructive, and GIMP is destructive. And 99% of what professionals need is non-destructive tools. So... That's why PhotoP is instantly better no matter what. Even if the tools were the same and not as featureful, it would still be better because it's non-destructive. And for those who don't know what that means, it essentially means that when you create a document inside of PhotoP or Photoshop, anything that's non-destructive, like Krita is non-destructive, Inkscape is non-destructive, those, those, those are different types of programs, but they're similar things uh, in the same rough space. Well, when you have a document that is non-destructive, it means you can do all the stuff you want to do, manipulate whatever you want to do, add whatever effects you want, and then save it. And then come back a week later and adjust anything that you did without having to redo anything else. Whereas a destructive system like GIMP does, when you make a change, the thing that you make becomes a new overall composite. And you can't just go back without doing control Z and in non in a destructive system, you actually can't go back at all unless you make copies of everything you do. But in the sense of non-destructive, you can have a step, you can do a process that your, your document made 50 changes and you could go back specifically to change number 26 and change that one particular piece and everything after it would automatically adjust. Whereas a destructive, that would be impossible. So that's why professionals need non-destructive and that's why gimp is just not anywhere close to being an option for professionals and because it's been around for so long i think at 25 years it probably won't get there unfortunately yeah. well that's why there's a saying that choosy moms choose photo pee. and <laughs> i totally actually choosy moms choose gif oh okay oh, i got that one mixed that's up. the phrase but in any case we're not saying GIMP is not an amazing piece of software that's great and is open source. And that just definitely gives it a big feather in the cap because I know people hear what they want to hear and they're going to be like, you guys are saying it's a terrible thing. And I want to be clear. Michael said 90% of users, GIMP is perfectly fine and suits the purpose greatly uh, for most users. If you get into the professional realm, instead of having to use a VM with Windows in it and using Adobe, you can use PhotoP, much cheaper, has that non-destructive feature, makes it really cool. That's it. Exactly. So there you well, go. Well, I would also say the statement of saying this tool is better than the other tool is still true. It, if, if, even if you're a regular user who doesn't need a lot, it would yeah. still be a better tool. But at the it same is. time, I like GIMP its is, interface better, Photo P. Like it's much easier yeah. for me to now. I think it's actually more modern. And it's a miracle that it's on the web. So for a lot yeah. of people, I look at this as that blew my mind when I saw it. it Adobe Photoshop's one of those applications where a lot of people are like, I would use Linux, but and then with PhotoP, you can kind of remove a lot of those barriers there with yeah. that. Which you can't do everything that Photoshop can do. Like Photoshop is but definitely better, but it is so close. close yeah. yeah. It's 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 mind blowingly close. Yeah. So the tip this week is a way to be incognito in the CLI, CLI 
Ryan, what is it called? Come on, Jill. It's not called the CLI. It's called the CLE. We are the CLE. The CLE. We are the knights that say CLE. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So whether you want to say CLI or you want to say CLE, CLE. Yeah. that's up to you. You can utilize the CLE in whatever way you want. Ha, yes. Good job, Michael. Absolutely. After all, it means the same thing. The command line interface. Yeah. Actually, the funny thing about this, the first time I heard someone say CLE, I didn't know what they were talking about because I oh, always said okay. CLI when I read it. Yeah. And then when they said CLE, like, yeah, you could say that. Why not? Make yeah, faster. That makes sense. I In am fa- more proficient with CLE than you are with CLI. It takes you so much longer to say the same thing. You know what I mean. Well, Please, just to yeah. just to be a different, just be different. I'm going to say Cly instead. <laughs> Ooh, now we're really going to make some people mad. I love the Cly too. Oh, Jill, tell boy. us about incognito mode in the Cly. <laughs> so our tip this week is incognito mode for Bash. So in Bash, you can add a space before any command to prevent it from being added to the the history. I have actually been using this for many years. So all you have to do is just leave a space before any command, like htop, and voila, the simple htop command isn't listed when you use your up or down arrow keys. (gasps) It's that easy. (laughs) And and this is actually extremely helpful when you want to run dangerous commands that you don't want to accidentally repeat with up arrow or control R. (laughs) <laughs> this yeah. is a really yeah. good tip, partly because I've been using Linux for over 20 years. I have been in the, the command line, the CLI, <laughs> yes. for many, many times, and many years, in fact, the amount of times you accumulate that. I had no idea this was possible. Oh, okay. So cool. Yeah, that's what that's what's cool about our tips. Uh, us hosts learned learn something yeah, almost every other week, too. Because of our tips, because right. we all... And it's one of the best things about Linux is yeah. you can constantly learn more stuff and it just gets cooler and cooler. Yeah, absolutely. And another way to enter incognito mode in Bash is to type set space plus zero space history with a space at the beginning and set space minus zero space history to go back. And this will all be in the show notes. <laughs> so it might sound a little confusing <laughs> when I'm reading it, but it's all in the show notes. And um, you can also use bash space plus zero history to start a new instance of bash with history disabled. Or yep. if you have already run some commands and want bash to not save history while exiting the session, type unset. H-I-S-T-F-I-L-E, and then exit. So just as a little additional tip, in some distros, the CLE, <laughs> if you do the space before, it'll still show up with your up arrow and things. So it depends on your distro and the CLE you're using. However... That is, that is a good a point because sometimes the experience uh, yes. you have in the CLI is going to be different yes. depending on the distro. So that However, the, uh, extra bonus tip, nice. Those commands to set... You know, using those set commands, then that works. Yeah, everywhere. then that so works everywhere. That and and there are a few other ways to do this too. Uh, there was another one where I, I had used a long time ago, which was a cat pipe bash, and, and that is also a way to you know run a program without uh, having it show up in the history. Nice. Yeah. Pretty cool. See, yeah. so many cool tips and uh, bonus mm-hmm. tips, and you're gonna be you're gonna <laughs> be the greatest cliers ever. <laughs> greatest cliers ever. All right. So for events, there's a couple here. We got the Ubuntu Summit, which Michael is going to. If you have that ever wanted true. to meet Michael, I'm sorry for you, but you could go what? to the. Oh, sorry. I mean, if you ever wanted to meet Michael, this is your opportunity to meet Michael at the Ubuntu Summit, which there is happening go. in early November. Yeah, yeah. It's early November. It's going to be in Europe. So if you are in or around Latvia, that's where it's taking place. I can't wait. I went last year. I thought I wasn't able to go this year, but I did get a chance to go. So that's going to be awesome. And we have so many cool things planned. I'm not going to tell you everything, mm-hmm. but I do have a talk that is planned at the Ubuntu Summit. So that'll be fun. And we have a lot more. And we're going to be talking about the summit as it gets closer and closer. 
And as each episode happens, I will tell you about one of the new things that I'm going to do at the summit so you can get, you know, wow. Excited I mean, that's a for what's going to happen. Right there. There you go. I personally can't wait to hear about your talk that will be about KDE, right? It could <laughs> cool. it won't well, be about KDE, actually. Okay. That's, that's true. <laughs> It'll be about the CLE. And if you want to meet all of us, you need to go to scale. That's where you get to Yay. meet all of us. And we have exciting news that we will be at scale 2024. It's scheduled for March 14th through the 17th at the Pasadena Convention Center, which is conveniently located in Where? Pasadena, California. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. There Southern California uh, Linux Expo is in California, and the, the Pasadena Convention Center is in Pasadena. Uh, that's, that's, yeah. that's really good to know. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> and there you can hang out with the entire DL crew, plus all the amazing vendor vendors, vendors, vendors or vendors, and presenters, and open source enthusiasts every single year. We go there, well, last few years we've been there and every single year skill happens. And Jill's been there for like, mm -hmm. I think since it started. Yeah. And, but now she's hanging with us. So we get to look <laughs> cool walking around with Jill, which makes us look exactly. cool by default. And same rules apply, by the way, as last time. If you want Jill's autograph, you have to get Michael or my autograph first. You're not allowed to skip directly to Jill. So we feel important too. Aww. Exactly. Yes. We know that she's the best host of the show. No. But let us pretend, people. Let us have something, people. Oh, something. no, we're all equals. We're all equals. Yeah. <laughs> well, you tell them, Jill. A big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. And you need to come join us on Discord. Speaking of applications, I have a lot of enhancements and things. Discord's like every time I open it, it's like new feature, new feature, yeah, new feature. Constant updates, yeah. Kind of crazy. Uh, so check it out. Go to tuxdigital.com slash Discord. This is a cool place to hang out with the community, talk about Linux, talk about gaming, talk about fitness, talk about whatever you want. It's right there in the Discord channel. If you want to watch the show live, well, become a patron and you can watch the show live. And watching live is just one of the awesome perks that you get when you become a patron. So go to tuxdigital.com slash membership. And another thing to talk about Discord, you actually get access to the patron-only section of our Discord server. So there's another value of the Discord server. But in addition to that, you can also join us in the patron-only post show that happens every week after the show and so much more. Plus, we just introduced an ad-free ad free version of the show that you can get by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership. So do that. Plus, tuxdigital.com slash store to get all some swag. It's swag. Like the t-shirts, the hoodies, the mugs, the hats, the stickers, so much more. Christmas Tux is right around the corner. Yeah, right around the corner. Actually, it's getting closer and closer. Yeah. So you're what you say. Almost it's right. Almost right. Yes. <laughs> yes. And make sure to check out all the incredible shows here on Text Digital. Do you want to learn about enterprise Linux, cloud management, and technology? Check out our awesome The Pseudo Show. And everyone head to textdigital.com and subscribe to all our great shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching in the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody have a great week. And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks everyone. Yay. We'll see you next week. <laughs>